So people of God, um, last week for you all that jumped on, you remember we talked about um, what is going on in this time. We talked about how God was using reformation. God was using restoration and revival um, to reach his people. And we talked about what if, and we talked about some of these things, uh, what if reformation never happened, basically without reformation and believers challenging the status quo church, our present reality regarding the things with God would be very different. We wouldn't have Bibles. We wouldn't have a lot of these luxuries and things that we take for granted. At one period of time, there were people who didn't have these things, didn't believe the same things that we believe, and didn't have access to some of the things that we have. So this all came through people challenging and reforming the things of God. Amen. And we talked about how God is reforming, restoring, and reviving. We talked about how a lot of denominations today are really just reformations that people made monuments out of. Okay. We talked about that last week. So when we look at Lutherans, Presbyterians, Methodists, Pentecostals, Charismatic, all of these at one time were movements. Lutherans challenged the Catholic church saying we must be, we can be saved by grace through faith because the church was teaching something different at that time. You have Presbyterians challenge the church structure at a certain period of time. You had Methodists and John Wesley preaching holiness and preaching that, hey, we can be regenerated by the spirit of God. We don't have to stay in this lowly, always fallen state or mindset, okay? He challenged that and, and we got the holiness movement that came later and we had Pentecostals and Charismatics that challenged saying, hey, you know, I believe the gifts of the spirit are still for today. I believe we can still speak in tongues. I believe we can still lay, lay on hands. I believe that we can still prophesy because a lot of churches weren't teaching that at that time. And what's interesting about all of these movements, when these men and, and women came preaching and believing these things that some of them hadn't even seen yet, they were put out of their churches. They weren't allowed in, they weren't allowed a, a, a stage. You know, when, when, when uh, a lot of these groups came out, they were, they were members of different churches at a certain time. They realized that, hey, we can't really dwell uh, with them because they won't let us, you know, uh, preach and teach what we believe. They're, they're confining the truth behind their statements of faith, their denominationalism, so forth and so on. So a lot of the reformations were really just denominations uh, a lot of the uh, denominations are really just reformations that people made monuments out of. So a lot of these places now, they're really, we're seeing museums. We're seeing uh, just things that people preserved in time. All right. We talked about Christ and his apostles. We're also reformers. We talked about the fact that most of the Bible is about reforming. We see Adam and Eve in the beginning, they fall. And then from then on, we're seeing reformation taking place. We're seeing God uh, bringing people to his laws, his commandments, and his ordinances to keep people doing and following after his ways, okay? We see Israel doing it for a little while, and then we see reformation coming through the mouth of the prophets, calling out the things that the church was doing, the people of God were doing that God was trying to get them to change, amen? So Christ was coming against the people in his time, preaching against the traditions, the dogma that they were teaching in that day, amen? Then we see the apostles doing the same thing. So I'm not covering all that stuff, Again, but really what I want to get to what we talked about last week is can the church be relevant in the present day in a day of isolation and a day of the building being not quite uh, being able to be used the same way it was used two years ago. Okay, so we got a picture here of a crumbling church. Uh, we're seeing here on the headlines, one in five churches can face permanent closure within 18 months because the system that was being used and how things were working has been disrupted, okay? But I challenge you, like we said last week in Matthew 16 and eight, Christ said, the gates of hell will not prevail against the church. So that's a promise, that's, that's a fact. That is the truth of what is true about the kingdom and about the kingdom of God and his people. The gates of hell will not prevail against us, okay? But the early church in Acts chapter two and all throughout the first century, they were building and doing the work of God without none of the things, and most of the things that we have today, okay? They didn't have a church building. They weren't building church buildings, okay? A lot of the things that we think are absolutely necessary to do ministry, they didn't even have, okay? So the challenge I said to you was, yes, we can be relevant and sustained in this present time, but we must go back. 
right? We have to go back. We got to reform and challenge our traditions that hinder revival and keep us stuck in old paradigms, right? We have to restore the original teachings of Christ and his apostles, and we have to revive and ignite believers by seeing the scriptures in action. Amen. So that's what we covered last week. Again, I'm not going to uh, cover it too long, but so today what we're going to talk about is the truth about the temple. And before we do that, I want to cover a couple of things in the Greek. I know I told a lot of people uh, that you that are in the class to make sure you get that Greek interlinear uh, downloaded or uh, look at the blue letter Bible um, dot com where you can look at the tenses and the moods and all these different things around the verbs because uh, uh, around the scripture because it really helps to bring some illumination to the scripture. Okay, so uh, as I said last week, the New Testament was written in Koine Greek. There's other copies that were uh, that had. There's supposed to be a book of Matthew that was written in Hebrew, but it's lost. Apparently, no one can find it. But uh, there's a lot of early writers who said there was one at that time. But for most most of us, or from uh, for most the, of the world, we only have it in the Greek Koine Greek language all right and as i said last week converting the koine greek language to english was not an easy task okay there is a lot to greek it was a much much older uh language and it had much more depth to it than the english language does okay for instance when we talk about words in the greek there can be many 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 different ways you can say or write one word okay for instance, if we look at the word um, saved, there's a word saved that we use a lot in the New Testament. And that word is in different forms. Sometimes you see it written as soteria, which typically means uh, salvation. But in the Greek, we also see um, this word here, which is sozo. And that's the word we see in Romans 10 and 9 and 10. If you shall confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God hath raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. That word there is so so saved. Okay. But if you look here, this is the word saved. And there's this is all the different ways you can say saved in the Greek. Look at all these different versions of saved. You got this one, you got this one, you got this one, you got verb present particle, uh, part, participle. You've got all these different ways of saying that. And sometimes when they say it, it means something a little bit different. Okay. And we're going to look at that and it's going to be very important. We understand this because when we look at some of these words and some of these things that we've been saying, it's very important that we can get the real heart of the matter and what the writer was actually saying. Okay. Um, so this is very important. So again, this is all different ways you can say saved. Okay. <laughs> And this is many, many, many different ways that they wrote it in the Greek. Okay. But when we look in the English Bible, we just see saved. And what they typically do is they add, added a couple words before or after the word to give it the meaning in English. Okay. So let's go back to the Greek. And today we're just going to really quickly talk about moods. So there's different things you can attach to Greek words. You can attach the mood, you can attach the tense. You can attach um, a couple of other different things, but I don't want to get too deep into it because I really want to keep this very lighthearted and very uh, high level so we can get into the lesson, okay? But really the mood of a verb has to do with statements, with a statement's relationship to reality, okay? So we're talking in this particular point, we're talking about verbs. And we all know from English, verbs are actions, right? Verbs are action words they talk about doing something or something that will happen okay so in the greek they were able to actually write the mood of a verb by simply writing an inflection on the letter or the word to make it have that meaning okay so mood deals with the fact or of whether the statement is actual or if there is only the possibility of its actual occurrence okay i hope i'm not losing you but again it deals with the fact of whether the statement is actual or if there is only the possibility of it occurring. So it can actually be happening or absolutely happen, or it could be possible that it could happen. Okay. All right. So different verbs that uh, we see in the Greek, different moods, indicative, imperative, subjunctive, and optative. I'm going to go through them real quick. Okay. Indicative mood. 
The indicative mood of a verb, I got a bug flying in my face. Indicative mood is a statement of fact or an actual occurrence from the writer's or speaker's perspective, okay? So if he's writing and he says, and he writes a verb in the indicative mood, it means that it's a fact, okay? For example, Revelations 12 and 11, it says, and they overcame. The word overcame there is a verb. It says they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony, and they love not their lives unto death, okay? So the word overcame here is, if you look in the inner linear, you'll typically see it. I'll have this little code next to it, okay? And it'll say, I'm feeding off a little bit, hold on. It'll say whether, it'll give you this little code and it'll tell you what that code means. So it has a V, a A, a I, a, and then a three P. The V means a verb, A is the A or is tense. We'll go on that, we'll cover tenses maybe next week. But here is the I in the middle, which means it's an indicative move. So in other words, it's a fact. He's not saying it's possible they overcome by the blood of the lamb. It's a fact. We overcome by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony, and we love their lives not into death, okay? And even throw a bonus point in there, the aorus tense basically deals with time. So it's not saying in the aorus tense, what it simply means is that it doesn't, uh, there's no set time for that. It can happen at a set time. It can ha happen at a specific time. It can be happening over time. It can happen whenever it's necessary, right? And that's what's so amazing about it because we're still overcoming by the blood of the lamb. You know, it didn't happen in the past and now we don't have it no more. No, we can still claim the blood. We still plead the blood. The blood is still covering, it's still working. So we are overcoming by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony, amen? So that's the indicative move. Imperative mood. If a verb is written with an imperative mood, it's a command or an instruction given to the hearer. It charges the hearer to carry out or to perform a certain action. All right. Here's an example. Second Timothy 2 and 22. Flee also useful lust, but follow righteousness, faith, charity, peace with them that call on the Lord out of a pure heart. Okay. The word flee here. There's the code VPAM2S. V means it's a verb. P, it's in the present tense. So he's not saying do it in the future. He's saying do it right now. Flee useful lust. All right? And we can see the M means it's in an imperative mood, which is it's a, a command. So this is a command. This is an action. This is a charge. He's telling, this is Paul writing to Timothy. He's saying, flee. I command you to flee useful lust. And the word follow there is also a verb. And that's also in the imperative mood. So it's also an action. All right? It's also a command. So that's important. So we're seeing that these words can have different meanings or different little inflections depending on what the writer wrote when he wrote it, okay? Next one, subjunctive mood. Indicates probability or objective possibility, okay? It's possible the action will happen, but it depends on certain factors or circumstances. This is basically the if then statement that we have in the English language, okay? In the Greek, it was a subjunctive mood. In English, we say if, then this will happen, okay? So if, but there's an also a, a kind of a, a little bit of a curveball with subjunctive. If the mood is used in a result clause, if then, then the verb becomes a definite outcome, okay? So it can be possible it could happen, but if you do the if, then it's definite. It's a fact, okay? Example, Ephesians 3 and 10. To the intent that now unto the principalities and powers in heavenly places might be known by the church the manifold wisdom of God, okay? The verb there is to be known. It's in, it's in gold here. We see it's the S. It's in the subjunctive mood. So in other words, you can see here that it might be known to the church. <laughs> Some of these things that are in the heavenly places and in the wisdom of God, but you have to continue in the things of God. There are things that will be revealed to you. There'll be things that'll be outlined for you. There'll be things that will be brung down and it'll be revelation given to you, right? But again, it's saying it might be known. And that's why I put might be here. This is the KJV. They added the word might be. Okay, because in the English language, again, we have to add words to get those moves. We can't just say, 
heavenly places be known by the church. It wouldn't make sense to us. So they had to add might be to the sentence. And that's what gave the sentence that meaning. All right. So that's the subjunctive mood. And then the last one, optative. Optative is simply used to convey a wish or hope for a certain action to occur. Okay. So sometimes when they write verbs, it's writing as a wish or a hope. I hope this happens. I wish that this would happen. Okay. First Thessalonians 5 and 23. And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. And I pray God that your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless until the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. This is Paul writing to the Thessalonians this is near the end of the, uh, the letter. And he says here that the very God of peace sanctify you. The word sanctify there is an optative mood. So he's saying he hopes, he's hoping, he's wishing that you would be sanctified, holy, okay? In other words, hey, you got to continue. Continue in what I taught. Continue in what I have brought to the church, okay? And I hope that the very God of peace will sanctify you, holy, uh-huh. And I pray your whole spirit and soul and body will be preserved. Preserved is also in the optative mood. So basically what he's saying here, this is kind of like a benediction a little bit. He's saying, I hope and I pray that this will happen for you. And then he goes on to finish the letter, amen, okay? So uh, interesting again, because if you took this verse out of context, you, would, you wouldn't really get that meaning. You would kind of think this is a definite thing, but in the way he wrote this, he didn't write it that way. He's saying, I'm hoping these things happen for you to the people in Thessalonica. Now, I put the word, I pray God here in red. They added that. KJV, they added them three words. It, he didn't write, I pray God, your whole spirit and soul body be preserved. But because it's in the optative mood and it's conveying a wish or a hope, they had to add something to show you that he's hoping this would happen, okay? And other versions, they didn't say, I pray God. If you look at the modern KJV, they write, I hope your whole spirit and body. It says hope there or may. Okay. So that's what we do in the English. We add, have to add those extra words to get those meanings. So the scripture makes more sense. Amen. Before I move on, does anybody have any questions about any of that? Um, because again, it's going to be important when we look at some of these words uh, in the New Testament. Amen. Well, I guess I did a good job. Praise God. I'm not a Greek <laughs> um, expert by any, any means. Uh, again, I'm learning and I'm, I'm trying to study and understand these, uh, these tenses and these different moods because I'm telling you, when I started to see this, it, it, it really did bring more revelation and illumination of the scriptures. There are a lot of scriptures that are being proof text and misused and mishandled in the church and it's so important that we be students of the scripture and we really study to show ourselves approved because it really does bring life out of what was written okay and we get into the heart and the mind of the writer okay I, we can't just make scriptures mean what we want them to mean they mean what they mean and they, they mean what the writer meant for it to mean okay so let's make sure we are students and we are handling uh the scriptures uh, with accuracy and we're not handling it haphazardly. All right. So we're going to deal with the truth about temples. And really, this is a such an awesome topic. It really is. Um, <laughs> um, people hold to the temple very, very uh, deeply and very seriously. Um, most of you all on the call and even whoever is going to listen to the recording, you may have heard different scriptures in the New Testament talking about, you know, no, you're not the year of the temple of God and these different things where, you know, the writers are saying certain things. Um, but it's very clear that the apostles, not only the apostles, Christ and the apostles and the early church all had a clear understanding about the temple of God. And they were very clear and very particular about how they spoke about the temple of God. They knew the temple of God was them. They knew how uh, the New Testament and the New Covenant changed the way things happened. Okay. 
somewhere down the line, and we'll cover that, uh, the history of it, but somewhere down the line, we went back to the old covenant and we recreated the old covenant and slapped Jesus on top of it. And that's all we're doing today. Um, so it's amazing to me that when you look at our vernacular and how a lot of people in church speak, we say we're the church and it's not a building, but then we still go to a building. We call the, it the house of God and we call the sanctuary, the sanctuary of God. And we build an altar and we do all these different things and so it's almost like, okay, so what do we really believe? Do we really believe the scripture? Or are we just using it as, as kind of like a means to do our ministry and just, you know, make a name for ourselves? But are we really going to grab hold to what the scripture is saying? Okay. A couple of scriptures come to mind. I got it right here on the, uh, on, on the page. One of the, the big ones that's right there in Acts says, God dwells not in temples made with hands. Let's go to Acts 7 and 48. Okay. And this is, basically Stephen preaching and I'm not going to read the whole discourse, but basically down in Acts 7 and 48, he says this, how be it the most high dwelleth not in temples made with hands as said the prophet, heaven is my throne and earth is my footstool. What house will you build me? Said the Lord. And what is my place of rest? So, in this whole chapter here, Stephen is preaching to the uh, Jewish people um, and he's basically talking about Christ and he kind of gives a discourse about all the things that happen in the law and the prophets, right? And then we kind of can just skip down. I'm not gonna read all this, but he basically says here, you took up the tabernacle of Moloch and the star of your God, Remphan, figures which you made to worship them and I will carry you away into Babylon. He's quoting, all of these from the law and the prophets okay he's basically requoting what is already written okay he says our fathers had the tabernacle of witness in the wilderness as he appointed them speaking to moses that he should make it according to the fashion he was seeing okay keep going down it says and our fathers which came after brought in in with jesus into the possession of the gentiles which god drave out before the face of our fathers unto the days of david who found favor before God and desired to find a tabernacle for the God of Jacob. Okay. So we know David desired to build God a temple. Okay. It says, but David wasn't able to do it, but Solomon built him a house. And then he clearly says it here, but the most high dwelleth not in temples made with hands. That's straight from Isaiah 66 and one um, that he's quoting. So the whole idea that God doesn't dwell in temples made with hands, that's, this isn't nothing new. Okay. Isaiah 66 and one clearly says it right here. The heaven is my throne, earth is my footstool. Where is the house you will build unto me? And where is the place of rest? He says, for all those things have my hand made and all those things have been, said the Lord. But this is what I will look, even to him that is poor and of a contrite spirit and trembling at my word. So even back then he was saying the same thing. Look, y'all want to build me these things. I didn't even ask for this stuff. But again, you can't, I don't dwell in temples made with hands. What I want is a person with a poor and contrite spirit that trembles at my word. So it was all the way written in the law and the prophets. So when we get to Acts, you know, Stephen is just really just quoting it. So why is he quoting it here? Because they never listened to it then. They didn't listen to it. That's why he's saying here, but Solomon built him a house with the most high dwelling not in temples made with hands. Heaven is my throne, earth is my footstool. What house will you build me, said the Lord, and what is my place of rest? Has not my hand made all these things? Then this is when he rebukes them. You stiff neck and uncircumcised in heart and ears, you do always resist the Holy Ghost as your fathers did, so do ye. So it wasn't like this was new. The fathers pre previously did it. They rejected the prophets. They rejected the truth. Because I told you the prophets were coming preaching reformation. They were preaching change. They were trying to get people back to repent. And to, and to love God and to follow his ways, not just, you know, do the whole temple uh, posturing thing, but really know you got to really love me. You really got to be my people. He's saying, which are your, of the prophets have your fathers not persecuted and they have slain them, which showed before of the coming of the just one, whom you have now, uh, who, and you have now been the betrayers and murderers. Okay, so long story short, Stephen says all this stuff. We know what happens to Stephen. They get mad and they stone him. <laughs> so
So whenever you talk about the temple, it gets it gets deep because people don't like that. The Jews really actually did believe that, hey, this is the temple of God. The spirit of God dwells here. And this is a sacred, holy place. They even said the same thing about Jesus. Remember? Remember when they said when they were bringing Jesus before uh, Pontius Pilate, the Jewish leaders? He said, this man has said things about the temple. Remember them saying that? Because again, they looked at this temple as the sanctuary God as the the, uh, the place where God was dwelling, okay? And that's why they all went to the temple to go see God at the temple, okay? So, and it's so interesting too, because it actually gets double, they actually double down on this um, in the New Testament. There's another spot where uh, Paul goes to Athens. So it doesn't just say it once, it says it twice in the book of Acts. Okay, Acts 17 and 22. Then Paul stood in the midst of Mars Hill and said, ye men of Athens, right here. I perceive that in all things ye are too superstitious for I passed by and beheld your devotion and found an altar with this inscription to the unknown God, whom ye therefore ignorantly worship, him I will declare unto you. So I'm gonna tell you who this unknown God is, okay? God that made the world, and all things therein, seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands. He says it again. Now, this is Paul saying it this time. Stephen said it before. Now we see Paul saying it. So what do we see? We see two of the apostles, two of the preachers preaching the same thing. So we know this word was in their mouth. They had an understanding about these things, okay? Neither is he worshiped with men's hands as though they needed anything, seeing he giveth life to all and breath in all things, okay? And he hath made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on all the face of the earth and have determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation. This is what he wants, that they should seek the Lord if happily they might feel after him and find him, though he be not far from every one of us, all right? Key point right here in verse 30. And the times of this ignorance, uh, well, let's go back. I want to read 29. For as much then as we are the offspring of God, okay, we're going to talk about that later. The Bible clearly says we're his offspring. We're the sons and daughters of God, what the scripture calls us, okay? Sons of God, children of God, children of the most high. This is what it says, okay? But then as much as we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the Godhead or divinity, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm careful about this word Godhead, uh, here the KJV throws in here. We'll we'll cover that another day. But basically, this is the same word they use for God. The word they use for God in the Greek is theos. And here it's a little bit different, but it basically means you not to think that the goddishness or the godlike thing. Okay. So we would say ish in English. We'd be like, it's it's uh reddish or it's you know um you know, we would add ish on something when we say it's like something, right? So he's saying we ought not to think that the divinity or the goddessness is like unto gold or silver or stone or graven by art and man's device. Because guess what? That's what most people do when they build a temple. They want to add the gold. They want to add the silver. They want to add the stone. They want to add the graven art, artwork on the walls and man's device. He's saying we ought not even think that that's what the divinity of God is like. That's not what he's about. Okay, and this is what it says in 30. And the times of this ignorance, God winked at it. But now he commanded all men everywhere to repent. So this is what he's saying. Repent. We're changing. We're not thinking about that no more. We are doing what he wanted and what he designed from the beginning. All right? So, again, we're going to look at this stuff. It's very clear in the scripture. But I wanted to show you that because... <laughs> They were preaching. Um, they were preaching this teaching uh, in the early church and in the New Testament, but we started changing what we were saying later. Okay, and this is why again we're talking about Reformation, restoring and reviving. All right. So let's talk about a temple real quick. Before I start, any questions about anything I just said? Any, anybody disagree? Any any question before I move on? All right, praise God, I must be doing all right. So, in the beginning, 
Everybody on this call is advanced and been uh, in the faith for a while. We all read Genesis 1. We know that when God made everything in Genesis 1, he said everything was good. Okay. I'm not going to read that. Um, what we see in the Adam, uh, with Adam and Eve in the garden is God's desire was to dwell among his people and have a relationship with them. Okay. One of my brothers uh, sent me something this week. He's on call, Brother Larry. He was talking about uh, God in the cool of the garden. It was an awesome, awesome writing. And I, I have it here in my notes too. You know, one of the first things we see in the garden is God coming in communion and communing with Adam and Eve in the garden. That's in Genesis 3 and 8. The Bible clearly says, you know, God came, the presence of the Lord walked through the garden. And he said, and he would meet with them every day. He would meet with them and they would have communion. They would discuss and have a relationship right there in the, in the beginning. So God made them a garden. The Bible says that God made the garden. Okay. It says he made the garden um, in, in Genesis. It said that God planted a garden eastward in Eden is what it said. Okay. All right. So we know God made the garden. He put him in there and he had a relationship with him. Then we go to Genesis 4 and 26. This is what it says. We know what happened with Cain and Abel. Everybody on the call is pretty, pretty a Bible uh, student already. We know Cain killed Abel. Uh, we know that Adam and Eve were cast out of the garden. Um, so when we get down to Genesis 4 and 26, after Adam knew his wife again, she bare a son and called his name Seth. For God said, she hath appointed me another seed instead of Abel, because Cain slew Abel, right? And to Seth, to him also there was born a son, and he called his name Enos. Then began men to call upon the name of Jehovah. Okay, this is when it says very clearly that they were calling on the name of Jehovah. They were worshiping Jehovah. They knew him. They had a relationship with Jehovah. It's very very clear what they were doing. And the reason I show you that is this: when you go over to chapter five, the scripture begins to outline the genealogy from beginning of Adam, okay? So we see this is the book of Adam, of uh, the generations of Adam and the day God created them in the likeness of God made he him, okay? And then it says Adam lived uh, 300, 130 years and he got a son called his name Seth. So when we get to Seth, I'm, I'm gonna skip down quickly. Seth, Seth goes to Enos, Enos goes to Canaan. Canaan goes to Mahalo, uh, Mahalo. Mahalo goes to Jared, so forth and so on. We get down and we talk about Enoch. We know Enoch was not because God took him. You know, he, he was translated, right? Go all the way down, then we get to Noah. So you notice something here in this whole chapter. Cain is not mentioned in this chapter. Okay? So this chapter is talking about not only are they outlining Adam up to Noah, because again, we're going to go from Noah to Abraham to Abraham, and we're going to find Christ eventually later down the line. But again, we're clearly seeing that all of these uh, men and patriarchs, they knew God. They were following after things of God. Because we get down to Noah, Noah says Noah was a just man. He was perfect, with, uh, perfect in his generation. So he knew God too. So somebody had to tell Noah, someone had to teach him and show him the ways of God. Amen. Enoch walked with God. Says he walked with God. So we knew these were the patriarchs that walked with God. So God had a people worshiping him and calling on his name. It does not mention Cain. Okay, Cain is mentioned right here. Verse 16, Cain went out from the presence of the Lord, dwelled in the land of Nod, east of Eden. He knew his wife and he bare Enoch. He built a city and called the name after the city, after his son Enoch. Enoch was born Irad, Mahulil, Mahul, Mahulagil. I don't know how to say that, I'm messing it up. Methuselah, Lamech, and we see Ada, Zillah. This is the scriptures outlining who came from Cain. And we get down in here, we see another man killed somebody, okay? It was Lamech. Lamech said it to his wife, wives. So he had two wives. <laughs> this is the first time we see someone having two wives, at least how it was written in the scripture. It says, hear my voice, ye wives of Lamech, hearken unto my speech, for I have slain a man to my wounding and a young man to my hurt. Cool. So again, we see something going on with Cain's line. We see something going on with that because they... You know the history really says, and this is what the the tradition of uh, of the of, of of it the Hebrew says is that when Adam and Eve and them they were serving God, Cain left and went to Nod. They were basically the secular world. They were basically just doing whatever they wanted to do in their own spot. Okay, so the reason I'm saying that is, is simple. 
we really want you to see that God had a people according to his name all the way back in the book of Genesis. I, I think people skip over this a lot and we go right to Israel, but you got to remember God had people already calling on him. He already had what was good. Okay. He had people that knew him and were worshiping him. Okay. I wrote up here, Revelation 21 and three, just to confirm that God wants to dwell among his people. In Revelation 21 and three, it just basically talks about in the new heaven and the new earth, that it says that God is going to be with his people and he will dwell among them. All right. So right, right here it says, and I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, behold, the tabernacle of God is with men and he will dwell with them and shall be his people. And God himself shall be with them and be their God. Reason I'm putting that in here again, this is what God wanted. He wanted his people. He wanted us to uh, be with him and him to dwell among us and dwell in us. We're going to get to that. All right. So we see that in the beginning and also in the end. I already said this. So y'all had what he wanted. A lot of people overlook early Genesis. You can't do that. Why? It was 656 years between Genesis 1 and 6. Yah already had people calling on his name. He already had a set apart people for himself. The reason I'm putting set apart there in gold is it's very important you understand what set apart means because it all ties back to the New Testament. Okay. So he had people calling on his name. Here's the key though. Why didn't anybody build a temple? Nowhere in the scripture do you see them building a temple. You don't see anything about a temple anywhere from Genesis to Noah, okay? There was no temple. Why wasn't a temple ordered to be built immediately to worship the Most High? Why didn't Adam build a temple? Why didn't anyone else build one, okay? If this was important, if this was really what God wanted, we don't see nobody doing this. And it was still good, all right? Keep going. Genesis 6 basically talks about how all flesh began to corrupt his way on earth. So basically what the scripture is saying is there was this group that loved God and there was another group that, hey, we know the group didn't serve God. They weren't doing the right thing. Some people get into the Nephilim and, and fallen angels. We can talk about that another day. Really the point I want to talk about here is Genesis 6 and 9 clearly says these are the generations of Noah. Noah was a just man, perfect in his generations, and he walked with God. Verse 12 says all flesh had corrupted his way upon the earth. So we see it intermixing. We see something happening. God saying, hey, I'm going to destroy the earth but because all flesh had corrupted his way upon the earth. OK. Then we get to after the flood. We see after the flood, God sets apart a people to himself again. This time it was Israel, but it started with Abraham. All right. Genesis 12 and one. And stay with me because this is all going to tie in when we get to New Testament. So now the Lord said unto Abraham, get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and from thy father's house unto a land I will show you and I will make thee a great nation and I will bless thee and make thy name great and thou shalt be a blessing. So he's calling Abraham out to create and set him apart a people to himself. Genesis 18 and 9, 19. This is dealing with the fact of why he called Abraham. This is one of the reasons why he called Abraham. For I know him, that he will command his children and his household after him, and they shall keep the way of the Lord to do justice and judgment that the Lord may bring upon Abraham that which has spoken of him. So the reason, one of the reasons Abraham was called because God knew he was going to command his children and his household after him. There's revelation of that to all the fathers out here. It's our job to teach our children the way, the things of the Lord. Okay. Not saying we don't uh, bring them to assembly of the church and we teach them. But it's clear, uh, the scripture is very clear. It says, uh, the children obey your parents in the Lord for this is right. We are called to teach our children the way of the Lord. Amen. So this is what Abraham did. He was teaching his children the way of the Lord, which was very, very important. Okay. Very, very important. Why? Because everybody wasn't following God. Okay. I don't got it up here in the notes, but the Bible says that Abraham dwelled in the land of Ur, okay, which was in the region or the country of Sumer, okay? If you go and look up history, 
Sumeria is basically where it's Sumer, right? So it's Samaria, and they were called the Sumerians. Very, very interesting history with the Sumerians, okay? But long story short, the Sumerians served all types of gods. They had Ishtar, they had Inanna, they had Marduk, they had all these different guys. They had a, a and, they, and guess what they were doing with all these different guys? They were building temples, huh? So Abraham came out of a land where they were building temples to these gods, okay? And it's very interesting too because I'm not going to get too much too deep into the Sumerianism because it it it, it gets into some some other things. But the point I want to bring out is this. This is the land that Abraham came out of. The history is very clear. They've got tablets. They've got all types of history from Sumer because they call Sumer one of the first, um, one of the oldest civilizations they can find, right? Because we know um, that there was a lot of things that we get out of Sumer. One of, the, one of the things we see in Sumer was one of the first forms of writing. It was called cuneiform, okay? And they had a system of writing, which was basically pictographs. Okay, and then obviously you go over to Egypt, you see Egypt had pictograph type of hieroglyphics, types of writing, right? So a lot of different things here. Point I wanted to get to was, again, they were building temples and they were serving other gods in Sumeria. As a matter of fact, a lot of the gods they were serving in Sumeria, they were serving the same gods in Egypt. It's the same guys they were serving in Greek. They just changed the names of them. So when you look at Inanna, that was what it was in Sumer. We go to Israel, the New Testament, it's called the Queen of Heaven. The Queen of Heaven is the same as Inanna was in the Sumerians. They just changed the name, the languages changed, but it was the same deity they were serving, okay? I don't have time to get into all of that, but the point I'm bringing out is Abraham walked with God. He was teaching his children to walk according to the ways of the Most High, okay? It even says in First Chronicles that Terah's, uh, Abraham's dad didn't even serve God. So it was interesting that Abraham was learning this from his his patriarchs and his other uh, people in his family who knew God, amen? I'm not gonna go there, but you can look it up. Look up uh, Terah, T-E-R-A-H. You can search the scripture on that and you'll see that Terah did not follow after the things of God, all right? So after the flood, Yah established another people was the Israelites this time. <clears throat> was anybody between the time of Noah and Abraham righteous? Yeah. We can't sit up here and think that no one, no one knew God. It clearly says Abraham was teaching his children, so he must have learned something. He must have been righteous with what he knew. Amen. So we know that there were people who were righteous during the time of Noah and Abraham because God always had people calling on his name. Amen. So the interesting thing is we never see Abraham building a temple either. Um, and what I want to show you real quick, just a quick timeline that kind of covers some of the things we just discussed. And the reason I like this timeline is it does a good job of kind of seeing how all of these different uh, people mentioned in the scripture, how their lives lined up next to each other. And, you know, cause sometimes when we read the scripture, it says, and he lived a hundred years and begot this person. And then he begot this person, you know, we can kind of think of it linearly where we think, you know, he wasn't there no more, but, if you look at Adam here, Adam has said he lived 930 years. And after 130 years, I'm down here in the, in the bottom corner. I don't know if you can see my mouse uh, on the screen. It said he begot Seth, right? And then Seth begot Enos, Enos begot Canaan, right? So we see all these sons, all these patriarchs that were living. Well, we see Adam was living 930 years. So he actually saw Seth, Enos, Canaan, Mahil, Jared, Methuselah, and Enoch, and Lamech. He actually saw all of these sons. So all of these patriarchs all had connection or all could basically, you know, be connected back to Adam. He was still alive. Amen. So I think this is interesting. Now, when you see about the time Adam's di Adam died, you see who come on the scene? Noah. Right about the time that Adam passes, we see Noah coming, right? Noah comes along. He lives 950 years. He begot Shem, Arkphaz, Salah, all these sons, right? Uh, no, I'm sorry. He, he has Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And this uh, timeline only focuses on Shem because the Hebrews and the Israelites come from the line of Shem, is what the scripture says. So it starts to focus on Shem. And then you can see Noah lives 950 years, but then look what happens. Scroll down here. Abraham. 
Abraham is born right about the time Noah dies. Isn't that amazing? So we go from Adam to Noah being called. Then we go to Abraham. So you see God basically maintaining the laws, the commands, the ordinances, the ways of God through his patriarchs, all right? So we get to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph. Get the book of Job written sometime around here. It's kind of just flowing out here. And the reason I'm showing this to, we get all the way, finally, we get to Moses. Look how long this is from Adam to Moses, okay? This is like 2,600 years. And then God tells Moses to build him a tabernacle. Now, <laughs> people, are we going to sit up here and think that God never, <laughs> like, you know, like, why are we waiting all the way until the time of Moses to build a tabernacle for God? If this is something that God always wanted all along, this is how we worship God. This is how we serve God. We got to have a building. We got to have a tomb. No, look, we're going 2,600 years before we even get to God even saying anything about that. All right. So we get to the tabernacle. And I'm not going to cover this, but finally we get to a part that says, we hear of a tabernacle with Moses approximately 2,500 years after Adam. All right. Now, I'm going to cover the tabernacle in the temple of uh, Solomon probably next week. The key thing I want to show you here is this. Again, where God is calling a set apart people to serve him. This is what he says in Exodus 25, because Moses already led the people out of the wilderness, right? <clears throat> Into the wilderness, rather. Exodus 25 and 8, and let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. Okay? Because again, what does God want? He wants to dwell among his people. Okay? According to the law, according to all that I will show you after the pattern of the tabernacle and the pattern of all the instruments thereof, even so shall ye make it. Okay? So get into the uh, wilderness. This is what Moses is, is shown by God to do. Okay? Key thing you need to understand here, this is what God told Moses to do, okay? He was very clear about it, what he wanted. He says, I want to dwell with my people. This is what I want you to make. Now, like I said, most of the people on this line, you guys have studied the scriptures. You know the Bible. You know that in the tabernacle, there were some very, very key pieces of furniture and equipment and things that were in the tabernacle. And most of you all know all of those things pointed to Christ, amen? All of these things were symbolic and were uh, revelations about what was to come. Amen. So real quick, sanctuary. What does this word mean? In the Hebrew, it's this word here, mikdash. It's a hollow place, a consecrated thing. It could be a palace, sanctuary, chapel, hollow part, holy place, also called a sanctuary. This is what this word is sometimes or typically translated into in the scripture but it's a hollow place a holy place it's a thing consecrated to god and it comes from the root word to be set apart and consecrated oh lord here we go again because again these words are going to be important when we get to the new testament it comes from the word to be set apart and consecrated sanctuary is also viewed as a container for keeping something in Okay, so some of y'all been to a bird sanctuary, a butterfly sanctuary. It's a, bu a building, a room that keeps something in, okay? So that's what a sanctuary is. It's a hallowed, holy place, and it's a consecrated place that is for keeping something in, okay? Tabernacle. The tabernacle simply means a dwelling, okay? A dwelling place can be anywhere, okay? <laughs> Sometimes it's actually translated as a literal tent, okay? So we know the tabernacle of Moses was actually a tent, okay? But again, the word tabernacle is also translated to dwelling or the dwelling place, okay? It can be a residence, a shepherd's hut, you know, um, but a dwelling. There's a part in Job where in the KJV, it talks about Job's house and it calls it a tabernacle, okay? So we know we're not talking about the tabernacle of Moses, we're talking about Job. But in that particular scripture, they're talking about his dwelling or his tent, okay? So again, the word tabernacle means a dwelling. It's not some super deep word that means some real lofty only thing that is, is set for God. In the scripture, 
When we see the word tabernacle, it means for him to dwell or a dwelling place or a habitation, okay? So we've got to understand these words, and this is what I want to get to. The Spirit of God needs a set-apart place to dwell. Set-apart sanctuary to dwell tabernacle. We just showed you those words. The two words must be properly understood. The dwelling place of Yah is wherever he ordains for himself to dwell. You can't build whatever you want and call it a sanctuary or tabernacle. This is clearly shown in the Bible. Exodus 15 and 17, thou shalt bring them in and plant them in the mountain of thine inheritance in the place, O Lord, which thou hast made for thee to dwell in the sanctuary, O Lord, which thy hands have established. Okay? So we're going to look at it next week, but when God called Moses to build the tabernacle, there was a part where he said, I'm going to set my spirit there. Same thing that happened with Solomon. Okay. So the key thing there is that's what you have to know. Only God can make a place holy. The scriptures show us that it is God that sets apart and makes something holy. Only he can make an acceptable place to dwell. Okay. It's almost like thinking about you, you know, when you bought that house and you bought that apartment, you know, when you got it, it was cool. You know, it was some, it was empty though. You know, it, it has some carpet in there. You know, you may not like the colors on the wall. You know, it could have been the bathroom could have been looking raggedy. You know, you're like, okay, you know, I can work with this stuff. You know, I'm gonna go in here, I'm gonna paint, I'm gonna put change the carpet, you know, I'm gonna change a little bit of stuff around, I'm gonna put some decor in here, and then the finally you go, oh now it's acceptable. I like it, I'm comfortable. This is how this is what I want, right? So even you know how to make an acceptable place to dwell, amen. So the key thing we see in the scripture is that. God is the same way. He knows what he wants to dwell in and he makes the place acceptable for him. All right. Exodus 25 and 22. This is what it says. This is talking to how he's going to meet you. Because again, he wants to make it acceptable for him. 25, start at 21. And thou shalt put the mercy seat above the ark and in the ark, thou shalt put the testimony that I should give thee. He's, he's giving commands. He's like, this is what I want. Okay, don't do what you think I want. I'm going to show you what I want. And there I will meet you, and I will commune with you from above the mercy seat, from between the two cherubims, which are upon the ark of the testimony, of all things which I will give thee in commandment unto the children of Israel. So God is clearly telling you and clearly was telling them where he wanted to meet and how he wanted to do it. Okay. So we know God can be very clear about what he wants. Now, what's so interesting, I was studying this. Look at where we came from to where we're at now. We were meeting with God in a garden. <laughs> we were communing with God in a garden, in the earth, in his creation. We were enjoying his presence simply in the place that he created. So we got an opportunity to ask God, well, God, what is this? What do you mean by this? Oh, how can I? And, and there's so much just communion and revelation. This was before sin. This was before Adam and Eve fell. This is how he's communing with us. Now we see God communing with us. What is he doing? Oh, we got to have a mercy seat now. <laughs> Why? Because we need mercy. We're in sin now. We're in a different dispensation. We got to have a mercy seat. We got to have an ark of the testimony. We got to have the brazen labor. We got to wash now before we come before God. We got to go into the Holy of Holies. We got to, we got to present ourselves completely different before we get to God now. Because back in the garden, we could just walk. He just walked right through. He was like, hey, I'm here. What's going on? But now when we meet with them, oh, I gotta, it's got to be above the mercy. We got to be in the ark. The ark of the covenant represents the presence of God. Now we got to carry the ark wherever we go. We got to carry the presence of God with us. We got to have symbols to see the things of God that we used to already have and we used to already understand. So this is why, again, it's important to understand this stuff because when you get to Hebrews, Hebrews goes through all of these different things that were in the tabernacle and it says, guess what? We have a new and better covenant now. For that thing has been done away with and we're no longer under the old covenant. Amen? So the interesting thing about the whole thing is you got people that are still stuck in the paradigm of thinking God wants us to build him this temple and put an altar in it and put these other things in it. But he's clearly already showed us in Hebrew, hey, I've done a new thing. We're going to go to Hebrew. We're going to look at it because I don't want to just be saying it off the cuff. But we have been called into a greater, greater covenant. Okay. And 
I always wonder too. I'm wondering this, like, okay, well, we we took the we took the temple, we took the altar. Why not take the the brazen altar too? Why not take the laver? Why not take all the other things that were in the tabernacle? Why do we just stop with the building and, and then get the altar? Like we picked and choose what we wanted from the Old Testament and put them in the church. But it's like, yo, we got to realize there was much to that. And those things have been fulfilled. Amen. All right. So I'm going to go back. Make sure I see what time it is. I don't want to go over. We're at what? Eight o'clock. All right. Give me about 20 minutes. Feel the presence of God. Amen. So we get to the New Testament. All right. I'm going to skip ahead because we know the New Testament um, reveals a lot of the shadows and the symbolism in the law and the prophets. Okay. Didn't read this scripture. I want to go back and look at this real quick. Uh, there's a couple of scriptures I got in here. But really what I want to show you is that the law and the prophets, the prophets were already preaching reformation. They were preaching the things that were going to happen. And um, they were already prophesying that Christ was going to build the true house of God. All the way back in the law and the prophets, Zechariah 6 and 2. And speak unto them, saying, Thus speaketh the Lord of hosts, saying, Behold the man whose name is the branch. He shall grow up out of this place, and he shall build the temple of the Lord. Okay. Even he shall build the temple of the Lord and he shall bear the glory and shall sit and rule upon his throne. And he shall be a priest upon his throne and the council of peace shall be between them both. So this was already being prophesied and already being declared by his prophets. Okay. Clearly says it again, Isaiah, sanctify the Lord of hosts himself and let him be your fear and let him be your dread. And he shall be for a sanctuary. But for a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense to both the houses of Israel, for a gin and for a snare to the inhabitants of Jerusalem. And that happened. When Christ came, he was a rock of offense because he was preaching and teaching things that they didn't want to believe and didn't want to go with. So he was a rock of offense. But the scripture says, hey, that same rock of offense has become the chief cornerstone and it's the stone that we build on as the church. We are built on the foundation and the revelation of Jesus Christ or Yahshua. That's what we are built on. Amen. Says it again in Ezekiel 37 and 26. Moreover, I will make a covenant of peace with them and it shall be an everlasting covenant with them. And I will place them and multiply them and will set my sanctuary in the midst of them forever. All right. All right. So it was prophesied. It was going to happen. Christ comes on the scene. This is what we get to. Christ reveals the true temple of God. We'll go to John real quick. Check this out. John 2 and 19. Okay, not 19, 2 and 19. All right, here we go. Uh, popular scripture. We've read it. Jesus answered and said unto them. This is now, mind you, this is after he, he whips uh, <laughs> the people in the temple, okay? He's cleansing the temple here. <laughs> and so after the Passover, go, Jesus goes into the temple and he find all those people that were selling oxen and sheep and doves and the money changes. So basically, they made, you know what they did. They made the temple into a mockery. They were buying and selling. They were, they just turned it into just really a mockery. And he says, you will not take my father's house and turn it into a house of merchandise. Okay. And then he said unto them, destroy this temple. And in three days, I will raise it up. Then said the Jews, 40 and six years was this temple in building. And will you rear it up in three days? but he spake of the temple of his body. So he's clearly showing and revealing what the true temple is because y'all thought it was in this building. Now, again, we'll look at it next week. When God uh, allowed Solomon and David to build that temple, it came with a covenant. It was a relationship and a covenant that allowed God's presence to reside in, the, in Solomon's temple, okay? I'm not gonna go into that. But again, it was a conditional thing that God did with Solomon and David. Here's the point. 
Verse 22, when therefore he was risen from the dead, his disciples remembered that he said this unto them, and they believed the scripture and the word which Jesus had said. I, I look at this and I'm just amazed because I'm so glad that they remember what he said. And the key thing here is that they believed the scripture. Do we believe the scripture? Because we got to believe it too. They believed the scripture that the temple was his body. Okay. They believed it and they remembered the words. So you have to believe what he said too. The apostles believed it. And as we read earlier, they preached it. This is the true temple of God. This is prophecy fulfilled. We can't take that lightly. We can't take this as just being symbolic. We're going to show you it's not symbolic. We're going to show you this is for real. Okay. Matthew 24 and 1. Jesus went out and departed from the temple. And his disciples came to him for to show him the buildings of the temple. So they're marveling at the temple. Again, we talked about it in Acts. He was talking about, see, you think the Godhead or the goddessness of God is like unto stone and gold and silver. We think we think in that. You can still see it today. You look at the Roman Catholic Church and some of these other churches. We do the same thing, building these big churches and it putting gold on there and putting all the silver. And this is what we think that God is. Okay. And Jesus said unto them, see you not all these things? Barely I say unto you, there shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. So you think it's something. I'm going to tear it down. How about that? I'm going to tear down what you think represents me. Amen. And he said in Matthew 12 and 6 again, but I say unto you that in this place is one greater than the temple. Do you believe that? The scripture, the apostles believed it. Okay. So we talked about it earlier. The spirit needs to set apart hallowed place to dwell. We understand what the word sanctuary and tabernacle mean. He said that the dwelling place of Yah is wherever he ordains for himself to dwell. The key thing you got to know in the new covenant, we are made clean for the indwelling of God. Not a building. We, the people of God, are. Okay? A couple of scriptures. Oh, they went all the way back to Deacon. Okay? I don't know what happened there. Let's go back. <laughs> Praise God for uh, Zoom calls and technology. All right, this is what I want. Christ erected the true temple, his body. His body is us, the believers that are set apart. We are hallowed and we are sanctified for his dwelling. There's all the scriptures right there. There are all the words that we are gonna see used in conjunction with the temple of God in the New Testament, right? So what happens? First thing we see is we are called. We are invited and we are bid. Kletos or Kaleo is what it's shows in the Greek. We are elected and then chosen, eklektos. And so after we receive the call, we have to answer it. And we become part of the elect or the chosen, right? And then we are added into the ecclesia. See the word ecclesia or ecclesia? Very close to eclectos. Eclectos and ecclesia means the called chosen or the called out assembly, called out peoples. The New Testament, KJV specifically, writes church a lot. But it's important to know when we say ecclesia, it's really talking about people. Even the word ecclesia is from the root of people. We're talking about people here. So the reason we're saying that is because a lot of times when people see church, we think building because we've been, we've been, we've been, I don't want to say brainwashed, but really we kind of been brainwashed. We think, when we think church, we think building and it's not. Okay. And the church is hagios, hollow, holy, saint, or hagiazo, which is sanctified. So you can see hagios means holy. And then you got hagiazo, which is sanctified or holy. Got it. All right. And lastly, we are made holy for God to dwell, temple, which is nails, okay? These are the words we're going to look at. 1 Corinthians 3 and 16, know you not that you are the temple of God, and the Spirit of God dwells in you. If any man defile the temple nails of God, him shall God destroy for the temple nails 
of God is holy, hagios, which temple ye are. So the temple of God is holy. Because again, the spirit of God dwells in a holy place, a set apart place, a sanctified sanctuary. Okay. So we're seeing the words here. The temple is where the spirit of God dwells and we are the temple. All right. First Corinthians 3 and 16. Let's look at that Greek in a linear. Let's look at what the tense and the mood of that verb is. First Corinthians 3 and 16. Go look at the Greek interlinear. Praise God. Here's the word. Don't you know that you are? That's the verb. It says right here, the mood is indicative. And if you remember when we were studying the Greek words earlier, indicative mood means it's a fact. <laughs> There's, it's not a possibility. It's a fact. The writer wrote it in the indicative mood, which means this is a fact. There's no question about it. There's no denying it. There's no thinking it's symbolic and we're thinking of symbolic scriptures. No, it's a fact. You are the temple of God and the spirit of God dwells in you. Okay. Even the first part of the word, don't you know? That's a verb. It's in the indicative mood. He's stating a fact. He did it twice in this chapter, in this verse. Uh, so in this verse, he's saying two times that it's a fact that the spirit of God, even when we get to the word dwell, spirit of God dwelleth in you. Here's the word, the verb for dwell. This one right here. You can see it. I don't know if you can see it on your screen. I apologize if you can't, but it's an I there, which means it's also in the indicative mood, which means it's a fact. So, there's no denying <laughs> that you are the temple of God. These are not symbolic. We don't go and call something else the temple of God. We don't go and call something else a sanctuary. We are the temple and we are that sanctuary. Amen. This is what the scripture says and they are indicative and they are stating a fact. Amen. All right. I don't want to keep hitting that point home, but we're going to keep moving. First Corinthians 6 and 19. What? Know ye not that your body is the temple? of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and you are not your own. For ye are bought with the price. You were bought with the blood of Yahshua, with Jesus. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. I'm not gonna go there in the Greek. I can show it to you, but I'm, for the sake of time, I'm gonna keep moving. All of these verbs in this chapter are in the indicative mood again, which means it is a fact. There is no doubt. There's, it's not possible. It's not a, he wishes the temple of God is you. He's saying it's a fact. This is a fact and this is what it is. Amen. God wants the glory out of your body. He wants you like he's on the inside of you, just like he had in the beginning of time. Hebrews 3 and 5. <clears throat> and Moses verily was faithful in all his house as a servant for a testimony of those things which are to be spoken after but Christ as a son over his own house, whose house are we, if we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope firm unto the end. <clears throat> the verb in this passage again is in the indicative mood. He's stating a fact. He's stating this is the truth. Second Corinthians 6 and 16, in what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? Huh, for you are the temple of the living God, as God has said, I will dwell in them. So he's saying, as God has said. Now, where is he getting that from? That's taken from Ezekiel 37 and 15 through 26. This was already prophesied. He said, I'm going to do it. And he did it. So it's prophecy fulfilled. And guess what? Can you guess <clears throat> what mood these verbs are <laughs> in this chapter? They're in the indicative mood. <laughs> and that means it's a fact, people of God. It's a fact. It's definite. It's the truth, and there's no lack of, uh, there's no room for being a possibility or a wish. It's the truth. Amen. Keep going. <clears throat> Even Peter's saying it because we're reading something from Paul. Okay, now we're going to read what Peter said. You also, as lively stones, are built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. So we are that house of God and we're offering the spiritual sacrifice now, not a tabernacle like they did in the tabernacle. All that was symbolic of what Christ was going to do. 
Wherefore also it is contained in the scripture, behold, I lay in Zion, a chief cornerstone, elect and precious. He that believeth on him shall not be confounded. This is taken from Isaiah 28 and 16. So he's quoting the law and the prophets showing you, hey, the prophets been saying this stuff. Um, we're seeing prophecy fulfilled in the New Testament. Amen. So this Prezi got the, uh, I ain't going to say it got the devil in it, but it's acting crazy. But I'm going to keep rolling. And some other scriptures, Ephesians 2 and 20, very good one too. That's the one that says that we are built upon the foundation of the apostles, uh, the prophets. And again, they're saying the same thing. We're built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ, him being the chief cornerstone in whom all the building, uh-oh, fitly framed together. This is what this building is doing. It grows unto a holy temple in the Lord. Huh, how can a building grow? What? 22, in whom ye are also builded together for a habitation of God through the spirit. So again, they're clearly telling you what the temple of God is and who it belongs to, okay? John uh, 14 and 15 is a good one too. Um, basically in John 14 and 15, this is Jesus speaking and this is what the promise, he's promising the Holy Spirit. He says, if you love me, keep my commandments and I will pray the Father, he should give you a comforter that he may abide with you forever. Even the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him. But ye know him for he dwells in you and shall be in you. Skip down. If a man love me, he will keep my words. This is what's gonna happen. And my father will love him and we will come unto him and make our abode with him. That's where he wants to make the abode. He didn't say, if you love me, build me a church a building. He says, if you love me, keep my words, and we're going to come abode with you by the Spirit of God. This is the promise. This is what he wanted. This is what he wanted all along. He wants you. He wants to dwell in us, his believers, his, his saints. Amen? I didn't read um, the other scripture that I had up on the... Um, up on the board, and this president is still acting crazy, but I'm going to keep rolling. <laughs> it's Matthew 18 and 20, and what Matthew 18 and 20 says is that wherever two or three are gathered together in my name, there I am in the midst of them. That scripture is so important because a lot of people, when you start preaching about this, they're like, well, I felt the presence of God at the church. I felt the presence of God in that building, so I think it's his house. I think it's the house of God. I think it's the sanctuary, but... Christ clearly said, he said, wherever two or three are gathered together in my name, I'm there in the midst of them. Just because you can, if you want to do it in a building, you can do it in a building. You can do it in the street. You can do it under a tree. You can do it at the lake. In the New Testament, we see them meeting all over the place. We see them on Solomon's porch. We see them in the upper room. We see them at over uh, another somebody's house. We see them, uh, the Bible says in Paul, he's rented a school in Tyrannus and preached out of a school for a number of years, and many people came to the faith, is what the scripture said, okay? So don't make it, don't, don't use what you experience as a justification to say, well, I felt God there, so he must be okay. And that's the problem with us. We always think that if something happens, then it justifies everything else. No, he said, if two or three are gathered together in my name, there I am in the midst of them. This experience of 2020 should have showed us that, if anything else, especially for those who had not experienced ever being out of the church for longer than a week or two months or whatever. No, two or three is all I need. I just need you to come together in my name. Amen. I'm almost finished. Romans 12 and 1 just says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. The reason we present our bodies a living sacrifice unto God is because he's dwelling in us by his spirit. We have to give him what he wants, and we present our body, not bricks, our body, a living sacrifice. 
holy and acceptable, which is your reasonable service. Amen. Very important scripture I want to hear here. Um, New Jerusalem, Revelation 21 and 22. We know that in New Jerusalem, the scripture talks about that I saw uh, New Jerusalem coming out of heaven like a bride adorned for his, uh, uh, for God, for the husband. And it talks about there'll be no more curse. There'll be no more crying, no more tears, no more pain. Skip down to verse 22. There's something very interesting that's written there. And it says, and I saw no temple therein. For the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are the temple of it. And the city had no need of the sun, neither of the moon, neither to shine it. For the glory of God did lighten it, and the Lamb is the light thereof. So ain't no temple in the new heaven and earth. There's no temple there. Why? Because the temple is the, is the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb. Because that's what it was from the beginning. It's not something new. This is what he was going to do before. This is what was going on all along. Those things were just symbols to show you different things. The same way it says, neither is no need of the sun. Even the sun is a symbol of God. You notice how the sun, if the sun stops shining right now, everything on this earth would be dead. Because the sun is symbolic of the light of God. Because again, if God ever stops shining his love on us, we're all gone. We're all going to be lost. Amen. The sun stops shining, all the plant life would die, which means all the animals are going to die, which means all of us is going to die. Right? So all living things on this earth need the sun. We have need of it. And it light, it shines us. So we get to the new heaven. What? There is no sun. Why? Because the sun was symbolic of the father and his light all along anyway. All of these things he created are supposed to give us revelation about who he is. I'm not going to get into all the other things that God had made and did, but the point I'm making here is this, the tabernacle, the labor, the holy of holies, all that, all that stuff was symbolic things of what Christ was going to do with the church. Amen. I've got five minutes and I'm going to be done. So you can say, okay, I don't believe, you know, you know, you know, that's good. I believe what you're saying. I hear what you're saying, but let's put a little bit more of a, of, of a stamp of approval on it. Okay. I said that the apostles were teaching about the temple, the true temple of God. I, t I was explaining that, you know, um, this is what the early church believed. I'm going to run through a couple quotes to prove the early church did not build temples. Um, and we're going to end it right there. I'm not going to go into the history of the church building today. I'll, I'll hit that next week. Uh, but just to solidify, I want you to see that the early church was not building temples, okay? They believed what was in the scripture. And I'm going to show you here in the writings. So from the early church. So I've got some writings here from the first, second, and third century. Throughout all the writings, you do not see them mentioning building a temple, all right? And this is what they actually said. These are some quotes from some writers at that time. The word prohibiting all sacrifices and the building of temples indicates that the Almighty is not contained in anything. Wow. So that was written by Clement, 195 AD. So this is literally 100 years, probably about 90 years after um, Apostle John passes, about 100 years after Paul, um, and 160 years after Christ. You know, Christ began his ministry around 33. Uh, so forth. So he's saying they believe that Jesus prohibits the building of temples. <laughs> so that's pretty uh, different than what we think today. So he's saying here, God didn't want sacrifices. He wants obedience. Sacrifices are required due to disobedience. Okay. That's why he was telling Israel, look, I require, I would, I would much prefer obedience rather than sacrifice. Cause see, they were all in the sacrifice. They, well, God, I did all the sacrifices you want, but look, I wanted obedience over the sacrifice. I would rather you just obey. Amen. So he didn't want a building. He wanted you. More proof. We refuse to build lifeless temples to the giver of all life. Our bodies are the temple of God. If anyone defiles the temple of God by lust or sin, he himself will be destroyed for acting impiously towards the true temple. Of all the temples spoken of in this sense, the best and most excellent was the pure and holy body 
of our Savior Jesus Christ. He said unto them, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it again. This he said of the temple of his body. When they reproach us for not deeming it necessary to worship the divine being by raising lifeless temples, we set before them our temple. Woo. Wow, this is origin speaking. This is 248 AD. He wrote this. He says, we refuse to build lifeless temples. This is, he's speaking as believers. This is what they're doing. Now he's writing this as an ap uh, ap apologetic letter because there was other people worshiping and serving other gods. And they're like, y'all Christians, y'all weird. Y'all don't got no temples. Where y'all temples at? And see, we don't understand how revolutionary and powerful our faith was. We're talking about a faith that had no, uh, was not building temples. The center of our faith was meeting at people's houses and having a communion meal. This is where people will come together, They're coming together, breaking bread house to house and fellowshipping. And the center of the faith was communion, which was coming together and having a meal. See, we turn communion into just bread and crackers, uh, but it was much, much better than that in the early church they actually were having a meal and it just shows so much of more of the of the nature of god and the mind of god to say look i hey i want y'all to come together and have a meal <laughs> i'm telling you our god is amazing when you really get to understand him and who he is and how he designed for things to work it's, it's really really just just a, a release and a liberty that comes with it <laughs> a couple more quotes and i'm done here's another one you say that we build no temples to the gods and do not worship their images. Do we honor him with shrines and by building temples? So this is another guy, Arnobius is 305 AD. He's writing this. He's saying, we don't build no temples. Again, this is 305 AD. So we're, we're 300 years now. No one's talking about, they're all saying, we don't build temples. We don't do that. Last one. You mistakenly think we conceal what we worship since we have no temples or altars. <laughs> so again, he's clearly saying we don't have temples or altars. They weren't doing that. And the people of that day thought they were concealing what they worship. Yet how can anyone make an image of God? Man himself is the image of God. How can anyone build a temple to him when the whole world cannot contain him? Even I, a mere human, travel far and wide. So how can anyone shut up the majesty of so great a person within one small building? Wow. Isn't it better for him to be dedicated in our minds and consecrated in our innermost hearts rather than in a building? This is Mark Felix in the second century. This is 200 something AD. This is what the believers believed, y'all. This is what they were believing. They weren't, I'm not the only one saying this. This was crazy because it's like, we start preaching like this, it's almost like I'm the one or people who preach like this, we're the ones crazy. Uh, no, this was being preached. This is how people thought way back, even in that time. You are in the habit of labeling us with a very serious charge of ungodliness for the following reasons. We do not construct temples for the ceremonies of worship. We do not set up statues and images of any God, and we do not build altars. Neither do we offer incense, sacrificial meals, or the blood of slain creatures. This is again, Arnobius, he's, <laughs> he's clearly telling you what they do and what they don't do, amen? So I think I'm gonna end it right there. We'll talk about when and where they met. But again, the reason I'm bringing out these quotes is again, you know, sometimes, like I said in the early, uh, in the first class, in this class, we look at the Bible, we look at history, and we want to tie the two together because it helps to give clarity. Because a lot of times, you know, people can go in the Bible, they can come out with all types of different doctrines, all types of different teaching. I, I don't believe that. That's just what you think. Okay, I'll show you. The apostles were teaching it, and we have a clear history that the early church was not doing it. Okay, so again, I think it's great that we can go to these writings to be able to pull out these truths, and we can get a better, clear understanding of what happened in the scripture.